Hi, today we're dealing with the not insignificantly small topic of how we deal with the past and the present. But as always in this course, we're not going to do it just by looking at something broad and all the different ways that we're doing that. No, we're going to look at it very focusedly through play. And particularly, we're going to look at it through play in Minecraft, uh, which is absolutely one of my favorite games when it comes to dealing with the past. And for reasons that I will explain in this lecture. So when it comes to our, represent, uh, or, our engagement with the past or relation with the past, I just want to give you a very brief basic basic understanding not even an understanding more like a uh, pointing out the obvious things for many of you maybe but for some of you still bears because we're a multidisciplinary audience and a diverse audience here so it still bears to put down some groundwork here and that is to point out that how we deal with the past and the present is something that is generally captured or basically how the, the past is present in our lives even is something that is dealt with uh, through a very big sort of umbrella concept of cultural heritage, right? Cultural heritage takes up, uh, you know, the uh, processes of archaeology, archaeology and history, but also other, you know, academic disciplines that study the past. It is about um, very much also about how we, as a larger society, curate the past. So it's very much about heritage and memory studies. And of course, there's all sorts of different things that go into cultural heritage. It's really something that to too big to discuss here, right? There's also public archaeology and public history from that sort of academic perspective. But then, of course, there's the whole of society because our heritage is not made by us, right? By people like me, people with an ar background in archaeology or history or whatever that that's, that teach at a, at a university. No, it is in fact made by all of us globally, right? Or at least that's the ideal, right? That is the ideal of cultural heritage in the present. Uh, or in the current moment, at this, this, if we're looking at how we define, especially on a global level, but also locally, how our heritage, so those things that we value about the past, collectively, uh, are remembered and figured into our public communal institutions, should be very multivocal. And it should be very much about stakeholders. So who has a stake in the past, right? That's not just academics or historians, that's not archaeologists or historians or museologists or, you know, uh, the person working the ticket counter behind the local uh, the local museum. Now, of course, it's also those communities whose past it directly addresses, but also um, the communities that live sometimes right on top of the past that may not even be theirs. There's all sorts of different things that have to go into when you're thinking about 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 who are important when it comes to talking about the past and the present. I said, ideally, this is also very much a global and diverse cultural undertaking, right? Um, the reality of it that is that it is really all not that much, right? Um, I think the very first thing you will learn if you go into cultural heritage studies or inheritance and memory studies is sort of those are the ideals. And then secondly is that actually those ideals are much more complex uh, um, in practice but also, also in, in their definition, right, and and where people put what accents. So, for example, I think one of the great examples of shared sort of um, a shared culture heritage platform, Wikipedia, just in general, I think Wikipedia is an absolutely wonderful platform. But still, you see there, for example, in the discussion of cultural heritage, the very first thing that you see, aside from a bit of text, um, you'll see a picture. Uh, from the 18th century, so you know, European 18th century, of the uh, European, or well, not even European, but particularly Roman classical, quote unquote, or at least the memory of that in the 18th century of the of the Roman um, of the Roman Empire, right? So it's a picture that is itself cultural heritage from the 18th century um, that actually memorizes in that point in time the Roman Empire, which is, of course, wonderfully already very complex and uh, multi-layered. But at the same time, it's also very, you know, very narrow because it's, in this case, it's about the Romans and it's about one artist providing their view, a very classical view, right, on, on this idea. And this is not to say that there's anything wrong necessarily with that, um, but this is just to show you that there, when it comes to the past, especially in the present, there are also all sorts of other things that are you know, that are involved when we talk about it. So when we talk about the past, we often don't talk so much about the past. We often talk about the present as well. And those things that keep us busy in the present 
the politics of the presence, right? Those things that build our identity. Our identities are built up out of bits of past. That's at least the way I like to see it, right? And, well, to get back to uh, uh, Wikipedia, it is really about the past as selected. Culture heritage is about the past as selected by society. So it's not your own personal understanding of what pasts are important, but it's this quite literally inherently this political process because we all together, whatever we are, have to figure out what that past is about. Well, that could lead you to think that uh, the past is in fact not real at all because the past is made by us in the present, right? And the past is maybe even a construct. And although you're not entirely wrong there, I think because for these reasons that I'll just explain a little bit, it's also it's also a bit too much. There's there's definitely something tangible and real to the past. Exactly what happened, we don't know. Um, but there's there's something definite to it. We we know that it's, it's I mean all sorts of. Um, knowledge relativism aside, um, we know that there's such a thing as the past and we have general angles on what happened there. However, how we deal with that in the present is very much a construct, or maybe it's not a construct, it's maybe something else. But um, of course, the larger issue here is that how we deal with the past and the present is very much folk, very much dominated by grand narratives of the past, right? So the sort of general truism, history is written by the victor. Also not true entirely, but there are definitely things there that are dominant about the way that we view the past and the present. Those grand narratives of colonialism, for example, and how we get to reinterpret, uh, in this case, in this personification of America, what this whole continent, including its people and its fauna and everything, should look like, in this case, in the eyes of a, a German uh, sculptor uh, who did a lot of four continents. Uh, little statuettes, basically, not a sculptor, but a statue maker, marble statue maker. Um, anyway, um, and it's the same thing with other, I mean, this is a, a grand narrative from the colonial period, right? The way that we see America, very much in classical senses, again, going back to the Roman classical idea of this white porcelain lady with um, the horn of plenty and all sorts of other uh, things going on there. And at the same time, it's also something that's going, those grand narratives are still happening today, right? In the in the form of imagined communities, communities that we, certain people, not every one of us, but certain people would like to exist. And therefore, they start telling histories and heritages and creating heritage about it. A good example of that is, of course, the EU, which, uh, whatever your stance on it is, is not some sort of political, historical reality that has a lot of time depth, but still in the process of EU building, right, European Union building, there's all sorts of shared histories and heritage that we like to hark back to. For example, the story of the mythological story, the classical Greek mythological mythological story of Europa and the bull, right? Uh, who, uh, Zeus, who gets to basically uh, uh, kidnap Europa, and uh, it's not a very it's not a very nice origin narrative uh, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, that's up to the people in Brussels, not for me to decide what they put outside their building and of course at a larger level even at the un level this is also going on this sort of uh, back and forth um, um, at very high diplomatic levels right uh, of what our world heritage is about um, and at the very very sort of i mean i don't want to necessarily call it lower don't want to well you know what let's just call it lower at the lower echelons of the production of the past uh, for example, on the quote-unquote history channel, you also see this, right? This where you know, there's continuous talk of ancient aliens and how the aliens were responsible for, for those things that we know from the past and uh, for b giving us many of the wondrous things that we know today, which is inherently very much a racist undertaking because um, it is about what, uh, you know, it often discounts the works of people living today, indigenous people living today, that made all those wonderful things that are alive today. So at every single level, for all the way from the top of the UN to, I think, kind of kitschy art from the 18th century um, to um, ancient aliens on the History Channel, the past is something that is, well, it seemingly is constructed, sort of pulled out of nowhere, but it isn't really, because it is it is ongoing relation of what I'd like to refer to as crafting the past. And nowhere else in, uh, does the past get crafted better than, I would say, not nowhere else, but Minecraft is a 
supreme example of how we craft the uh, the past, how we may, how we give rise to views of the past in the present, particularly when it comes to build heritage. So, for example, some examples right here: the Eiffel Tower. I think probably one of the most built, uh, or at least envisioned, uh, half built probably because it's a tough build to uh, to finish. Uh, uh, buildings in uh, in Minecraft, Taj Mahal, um, and uh, Cristo Denter, and then also the Temple of Bell in Palmyra, the temple that got destroyed by uh, IS in 2016. Um, and um, all of those made in Minecraft. These are just this is a super, super small selection. And in fact, they are big um, sort of world heritage, uh, or I think maybe all of them could be listed under the world heritage. I wouldn't know, but recognizable heritage buildings but then there's also millions and millions and millions well i said billions probably of small heritages people that have been building their own special special spot that maybe is not a special spot for everybody else anybody else but it is for them and that really is what is brought together in minecraft um we'll be looking at some of these examples um in, uh, in the let's play but aside from that i'm just going to run you through uh, one of our projects, the, and I'm, our, I mean the Value Foundation, that uh, both Aris and I are part of, in which we crafted the past, the very, a very particular bit of past uh, from the Netherlands, and that is the Roman line, uh, Limes, so the Roman border area, in a project that is called Romeincraft, which is a great pun uh, in Dutch, but not a super great pun to translate, but basically means Romans plus Minecraft. So what this was, was... Uh, an interactive, playful, and creative uh, project in which we were going to involve and uh, an audience of all ages in the recreation of the Roman limes in, in the Netherlands. We could have called it the crafting of, but you know, it is. Uh, we also have to pitch these things to museums, and we're starting crafting. They 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 sort of get lost until they watch this video, of course. So we did this in fourteen galleries, libraries, um, uh, and museums in um, in the province of South Holland, Gelderland and Limburg, uh, lots of different places, uh, really a very nice, uh, even to just visit all those different places, and we would go there to build local heritage. So we would do that with people of all ages, and it was free entry, but in reality, of course, there were lots of uh, kids, children building with us. Um, not always, but most of them. And at the si aside from that, when those kids were building, we often... Uh, would still talk with their caretakers or whoever else they brought along of, uh, you know, a more adult age about what they were reconstructing, about what we were doing. So it was very much, um, uh, and I think the important thing to understand is that in the Netherlands, the Roman heritage, the Roman limus, the Roman border area is very much below the soil. There's a lot below the soil, but most all of it because of the river sedimentation is below the soil. So it's not something that people know or at least see a lot of in the current landscape, in contrast still to other places like uh, England and uh, Germany. So really the bottom line of it was we wanted to give people a positive experience with this Dutch heritage or this Roman Dutch heritage or, you know what, whoever else's heritage it was with this heritage. So just to give you a brief uh, view of what this looked like in practice, this is us fighting for space with uh, a local artist in uh, the Falk of Nijmegen during the Nacht van de Romeinen. Um, we would set up three computers, which would invite people to start play on. And uh, there was also a virtual reality set in which people could see what they were, what they had just crafted uh, in, in Minecraft. So they could actually wander through those buildings that they themselves had just been building. Um, and aside from that, we also had a lot of um, uh, sort of inspiration material, we called it. It wasn't some sort of uh, information booklet per se, but it was just all sorts of little pictures, including floor plans made by archaeologists, etc., to give people an idea of what they could be building in these Minecraft Roman spaces. This is what it um, <clears throat> event like looked like in practice. For example, this is us during one of the very first, uh, with, together with a lot of other participants, in the very one of the very first events in the Rijksmuseum van Oudheiden in Leiden. You see a wonderful setup in which some of us would be building, others of us would be sitting together and talking about what our other participants would be building together. So, but rather than keep on sort of showing you these still pictures of what this event was like in progress, I'm going to show you some um, moving images. In fact, I'm going to be in Minecraft showing you what uh, sort of things were built uh, there. 
So welcome to uh, Romainecraft. This is uh, the very first um, structure that was built in this world, in this map. It was built by us, uh, people from the Value Foundation. It's a watchtower. So along this road, in this recreation at a quarter scale of the whole of the province of South Holland, but then in 150 AD, uh, along this road you'll find, uh, well, in 150 AD you would find many watchtowers. And in fact, there's a, our second one popping up right there. So this wasn't built by um, by us. This was built by uh, a German boy who was um, visiting uh, Leiden uh, as part of, um, I think, some sort of summer trip. This was made at the end of uh, 2016, or at the end of summer vacation 2016. Um, and um, he built this watchtower in about 50 minutes. So 50 minutes later, this watchtower was there was clearly inspired also probably by the other watchtower that we'd already built. So we were thinking, hmm, this is pretty, this is going on pretty well. In this rate, we'll get to finish a lot of these watchtowers, but also other buildings that would have lined the Limes Road. Uh, so this road that was basically uh, across all of the, well, not all of the border of the Roman Empire, but particularly this part of the border of the Roman Empire. And this along this road, you would find interspersed, uh, you know, a couple, of, a couple of kilometers spaced apart, or tens, tens of kilometers spaced apart, these Roman forts. And this is the Minecraft recreation of the Roman fort of Matina. And there we go. Do not enter without permission. Well, we definitely have permission. And what you will see here in this Roman fort of Matilo are the the recraftings or the craftings, the renegotiations of a lot of different people building uh, the contents of this fort and what they think it looked like uh, back then, right? Or at least what they think they want to see in a Roman fort from 150 AD. So I'm probably you have some questions about the polar bears. We'll get to that. So just to point out, what we did was actually all the buildings that sort of were built under the supervision of archaeologists and other people of the Value Foundation, that we sort of were trying to build accurate or as accurately as possible based on our own knowledge of this. They were built with these. Um, well, in, in, in Minecraft there's this acacia wood, which is this very nice orange color, which sort of would um, look quite a bit like the colors of the Roman roof tiles uh, that would have been on uh, in uh, sort of uh, larger structures like this, not necessarily on every single structure there would have been orange uh, roof tiles, but at least this was a way for us to sort of show uh, for ourselves and all those other people that this stuff was rebuilt by us. So, for example, we have the Principio here. Um, not necessarily the fountain there is not our in, uh, invention, um, but uh, the Principio would be the commander's headquarters. Right now, it is uh, not a part of the headquarters of the commander, but it's actually a way of getting to other Roman forts in this very large province that you can actually, in Minecraft, that you can get lost in. I mean, not if you follow the road, of course, but this is still uh, more useful. So aside from these uh, structures that we made ourselves, barracks and uh, the Horeum, so the granary over here, uh, there's also, as you can see, all sorts of other structures going on. So one of the kids that played with us didn't think that this particular building over here would be nice enough for the commander of a, a, a Roman garrison. So this is the recreation of that uh, Principio uh, in, uh, in, his, you know, in his imagination or in his understanding of things, or at least in his... Uh, would like to think about the past that way, right? Um, somebody else was interested in baking a, a Dutch uh, sort of uh, uh, 17th century uh, canal house uh, impression of a barrack. There was all sorts of interesting things going on here. One of my favorites is over here, um, the watchtower that is a watchtower, but it's also a tree hut. So the, the, the boy that made this had this idea that... Um, you know, it's nice to be sort of watching out for barbarians, right? So the Germans across the river, they're not a German, sorry, the Germanic tribes across the river. Um, um, but at the same time, we want to be hidden, right? So this is very much something, of course, that the Romans would never have built, but it's an authentic engagement. It's an, a true engagement with, well, what would have been maybe smart to do back then, right? You don't only want to be seen and watch your borders, you maybe want to stay hidden while doing that as well. Not something maybe the Romans would have done, but it makes sense. And then, as you could have already seen, there are a lot of polar bears roaming this fort. So, one particular moment when we were building this, um, 
um, we found out that there was just, well, we found out, we got reported by one of the other participants mm. that somebody was spawning a lot of uh, polar bears into this fort. Um, and um, uh, the kid that reported that to us sort of wanted us to take action because, of course, this wasn't accurate. There wouldn't have been any polar bears back then, right? At, at least not, not in this part of the Netherlands or just not in the Netherlands at all, in the Roman mm. Empire at all. And they wanted us to sort of remove all of them. And in fact, they started running around destroying all of these things. But we had sort of a position mm. in place that we would not be destroying any of the things that people put in there or thought they would put in there, even if they were maybe trolling a little bit or counterplaying. Mm. Playing counter to what we understand of history in this case. There's a whole, um, well, in the very first um, presentation, I already talked a little bit about that when it comes to counterplay with the example of the, the Roman beach hut in Katwijk. This is another example of counterplay, sort of people that are renegotiating uh, power structures in the present through their uh, mm. engagement with the past in that particular moment. So that's why we kept the polar bears in, and that's why, in fact, we never really changed anything when it came to these uh, to these buildings. Even if at a certain point we had uh, probably uh, 15 or 20 of these classical style um, temples. So you can see here that classical streak that is very much present in the cultural heritage of Europe is also very much present still in our mind right now. Um, but for us, it was very important to uh, not do anything with that. And the reason for that was is that we wanted really to people to craft the past. And that was, um, what we mean by that is we wanted to have, be, have this be um, a quote-unquote democratic engagement with the Roman border area. So not what we think we should build, be building, not what archaeologists, the specialists think the cultural heritage of the Roman period should be looking like, no, but through this playful recreation uh, work work with that particular period together as a sort of a citizen collective consisting of Minecraft players rather than archaeological specialists and people of the uh, general public. So through our Minecraft we arrived collectively at a past that wasn't constructed or authored by archaeologists but was very much crafted by this larger collective of people, of participants, play participants, of players. And I'd like to sort of refer back to uh, the definition of fun from a couple of lectures ago by Ian Bogost. Fun as being something, or as being a relation to something that you relate to with care, commitment, and attention. And crafting, of course, whether it's a Minecraft or just generally in the world out there, is of course very much that as well, right? If you craft something, you're going to have care, commitment, and attention focus towards whatever you're crafting because if you don't do that you know it, it fails as a crafting project product right maybe it's aut automatized and it's not crafting anymore or maybe you know there's no care there and it just doesn't you know and, and it doesn't end up being the thing that you do or uh, you sort of don't commit to it and crafting does take a lot of extra hard work and but i think in a way that crafts of the past the past of craft is much more interesting than any other uh, past that we could have and that we could engage with in the present. So I think it's it's sort of, clearly it's not a model, right? It's not some sort of a one-to-one -one trying to be a one-to-one -one or even a scale uh, representation of the world, right? As maybe it's something we were thinking of earlier when we were doing it for Minecraft project, like, oh, we're going to make this one-to-four, one-to-two model, one-to-one -one model of the Roman Limus. Well, clearly during the process we found out that, you know, this is not an immutable mobile that we could just bring into the Minecraft world, no, there was this play process undergoing. There was not a map of, of the Lemus. This was a playground of the Lemus, right? It was not just a representation of what we were thinking about it, but no, it was a representation of many different things. And as such, it doesn't a representation as such anymore or a reconstruction as such anymore. It became this li living, breathing thing by itself, a living, breathing past. And as you can see, that's sort of, I don't even have the right words for it because it, it's a very messy process and it's a very freeing process, but still it is structured and authentic, right? There are people that engage with this with, with genuine uh, pleasure, joy, and attention and try to recreate those things that they really wanted to recreate. It's not some sort of random collection of block, blocks of, like thrown together, right? And part of that is also that it was very much a collective process, as I already said. It was very much a way in which we were talking with and they were participants were also playing with each other and it was just a, well, a communal effort right it was very much an interpersonal past that we're creating and that's also something that's created in many other games right especially multiplayer games are really good at um, 
being a platform to create, discuss, and share knowledge of the past or of any, any other thing actually together. So this is just one example of the many, many different things that we've seen in the course that shows that our relation to play in the present, but our relation to the past in the present as well, is very much entangled. And that by bringing them all together, and particularly by using play as a way of knowing the world, and particularly the past, is very fruitful and valuable.